In December 2000, Robert Hansen was working as the FBI's liaison to the State Department. Investigators had just discovered that he was the mole they'd been trying to root out for years. Neil Gallagher, at the time an assistant director at the FBI, invited Robert Hansen to his office for a meeting. I sat in a soft chair, and he sat probably three feet away from me in a sofa. So we're almost knee to knee, looking at each other, talking to each other. Was the atmosphere friendly? Oh, extremely friendly. Friendly, personal. I said, I'm not the smartest guy in the world. I need some help in computer security. I know your expertise, and I need for you to help. The last thing Gallagher needed was Robert Hansen's help. No. What Gallagher needed was to lure Robert Hansen from his post at the State Department back to Bureau headquarters, where the FBI could catch Hansen in the act. The fingerprint on the plastic bag, the voice recording, the letters to the KGB, the FBI had a compelling case against Robert Hansen. Did we have enough evidence to arrest him? Yes, but it begs an answer to the other question. Is he an active spy? Catching Hansen in the act would prove his espionage, and it would protect prosecutors from revealing more in court than the FBI wanted. The Bureau did not want the source, Mr. Pym, to testify or disclose how they got all that eye-popping evidence out of Moscow. Their goal? Corner Hansen, extract a guilty plea, avoid a trial. Hansen's do-little job at the State Department's Office of Foreign Missions left him on something of an island, across town from Bureau headquarters, with plenty of time to peruse the FBI computer system in solitude. So, the FBI decided to bring him back home with terms they felt sure Hansen would find attractive. The director, deputy director, and I have a conversation and come up with a strategy that we will offer Hansen an opportunity to work directly for me as a, an advisor on computer vulnerability of the FBI, especially with respect to Russia. We were playing on his ego. Gallagher had his secretary invite Hansen to his office and dangled the offer. Hansen would be leader of the information assurance section ostensibly tasked with figuring out how to secure bureau data from would-be hackers, thieves, and spies. Essentially, early cybersecurity. And oh, the irony. The FBI's worst spy assigned to guard its most precious data. Perfect. Hansen loved it. And yet, he hesitated. He was facing the FBI's mandatory retirement age at 57, just four months away. I said, I anticipated that I talked to the director and he's going to waive your mandatory retirement. Then Gallagher laid it on even thicker. And because it's so important, I've asked the director and he agrees to promote you to senior executive service. So I'm pulling the cord of his emotions that he's an expert and he's getting the recognition that maybe... He's been seeking his whole life. Your mentality going into this is what? I need to look him in the eye, because I'm looking in the eye, and convince you that I want you to work for me. One of Gallagher's deputies had been observing the meeting. When he walked out of the office, Mike looked at me and says, I'm about ready to throw up. I don't know how you did that. Because we realized we're sitting with someone that sent people to their death. Gallagher's performance worked. He talked to his brother-in-law about it, and we we captured that because we had coverage of his phone by this point, and we captured his excitement that he had just been given a great opportunity. Hansen would now enjoy the attention of the FBI's top brass and then finally bask in the recognition he'd always sought. Of course, it was all a facade, the FBI's version of the Truman Show, designed to ensnare a traitor. It was just before Christmas, 2000. He asked if he could wait for reporting to FBI headquarters until after the holidays, which 
to myself, I sort of smiled and said, that's good. Hansen was asking for what Gallagher most needed, time. Time to build the trap. That the FBI did not know it had a spy operating freely in its midst for more than 20 years was an absolute failure of its core mission. But once the Bureau discovered who he was, nailing the spy in the act was one of the most elaborate and successful operations in FBI history. From CBS News, I'm Major Garrett, and this is Agent of Betrayal, The Double Life of Robert Hansen, Episode 7, Room 9930. Up to this point, the Bureau's investigative energy had been misspent on CIA officer Brian Kelly. But Mr. Pym, the former KGB officer who gave the FBI the package with Hansen's fingerprints and audio recording, changed all that. Neil Gallagher, then an assistant director of the FBI, says a decision was made. Let us take this task force and simply redirect it, keep the same people on it, and change its focus from Brian Kelly to Robert Hansen. The code name for the Kelly case, Gray Deceiver, became Gray Day, the new alias for the Hansen investigation. In bureau speak, both cases were known by their initials, GD. So if you overheard office chatter of GD, you wouldn't know that anything had really changed, unless you knew. Agents signed non-disclosures. Nothing was to be entered into the FBI computer system lest Hansen see it. Over time, stacks of paper began to clutter the open bullpen desks at the FBI's Washington field office. Hundreds of FBI personnel would be read into the case. During the holidays, they got to work. Once he got under investigation, he was under 24-hour surveillance coverage. That's multiple teams. Multiple teams. Multiple shifts. 24 hours. Uh, never ending. Never ending, never stopping. Uh, some of it was easy because he was on a routine. He'd go home and stay at home. So as long as he stayed in his house, we were okay. But if he came out, there was a surveillance team on him. That is, once he got to a place where surveillance teams could inconspicuously latch on to him. Can you sit around his house and wait for him to come out? And the answer was no, we can't be that close. We're going to have to be some distance away. Well, the house across the street comes up for sale. A female comes in and buys it. The word in the neighborhood was that she was from the West Coast somewhere and would not be in for a couple of months. The West Coast buyer? She was actually an undercover FBI operative. She doesn't exist. They'll never find her. We could put closed-circuit TV cameras in it, and when he left his house every day, you could see him go out and go down the street in the direction until he could be picked up by a surveillance team. Hansen went to an early morning Catholic mass almost every day, often at a church near his home. Being a Catholic myself, I know how many people are lack there over at the 6.30 mass, Don't tell me that the pew behind him is going to now have six strangers. They got a elderly-looking female agent that dressed down and uh, just stood off to the side and, and, and went to mass so she wouldn't stand out. They also had to prepare for his return to headquarters. The FBI needed to monitor Hansen 24-7, but especially in Hansen's office, that prized bureaucratic real estate that made him feel super important. You were trying to create not just an office, but a recording studio. Exactly. A visual and audio recording studio. Rich Garcia was section chief for FBI operations. Neil Gallagher read Garcia into the case with a letter Hansen wrote to the Russians. He said, read this over, Rich. And at the end of the letter was signed Ramon Garcia. And I looked up at Gallagher and he's smiling and says, is he a relative of yours? And I said, oh, come on. (laughs) As section chief, Garcia ran the Bureau's computers, phones, and data centers. Before that, he worked drug trafficking cases in Florida and Latin America. Garcia's a burly guy with a beard, looks the part of a lawman, 
acts it, too. Rich is big into guns. He showed us some of his hunting videos. Dude can shoot. Garcia had to build an office for Hanson in short order over the holidays when the government is virtually closed. You have employees that accrued vacation time, and if they don't use it by the end of the year, they lose it. So people are taking vacation. They're not around. I had to come up with a, a way to try to get this place built. He chose to build out a ninth floor conference room, room 9930, just down the hallway from his own office. Hanson's suite would be located behind a secure door and divided into two spaces, a private 10 by 10 office for Hanson and an ante room for another employee. Blue industrial grade carpet covered the floor. Garcia recalled his conversation with the FBI's construction lead. He asked me, he says, uh, when you need it done? I said, actually, it has to be completed before the end of the year. And he says, uh, will they be able to get overtime? And I said, let me tell you this way. We'll pay all the overtime and we'll even restore any leave that they may lose by not taking it the following year. It took 38 years for the FBI headquarters building to go from an idea to a fully functioning office building. It wasn't even 38 minutes before construction began in room 9930. Their eyes lit up. They said, so uh, when you want us to start, you can start right now as far as I'm concerned. The construction workers, 42 of them, as Garcia recalls, did not know what they were building or why, only that it had to get done and fast. So I told him, it says, uh, when you finish getting the drywall up, don't tape and bed it yet. So they left for the night. And the reason we needed to do that is because that night I came back and met with the technical agents who came back and unscrewed all the drywall in order to place their equipment behind the drywall and screws it back up without those individuals who actually built the wall knowing that that was done. And when you say equipment, what do you mean? All the type of surveillance equipment would it be microphones, cameras, etc. That room was covered. There was so much radiation from all of the coverage that literally you could cook a chicken in there like a microwave. They also needed to figure out how they were going to manage Hansen's computer access. We knew that he had some advanced degree of computer knowledge. We assumed that he was constantly checking his traps to see if he was being looked at. Neil Gallagher again. We asked ourselves, what is he doing with the FBI's automated case system, which, given the size of the FBI, was huge. This was the Bureau's antiquated electronic database of investigations, which Hansen used and abused, both to mine for nuggets he could hand to the Russians and to peer over his shoulder. A review of Hansen's computer activity showed that he had repeatedly searched the database for his name, address, and dead drop locations. Hansen. Robert P. Hansen. Our colleague Ward Sloan as Hansen. Dead drop. Dead drop in Russia. Dead drop in KGB. Dead drop in Washington. 9414 Talisman. Talisman Drive. CCTV and Virginia. Vienna and Virginia. Drop site. Espionage. He also monitored the payroll system to track early weekend overtime requests, usually an indication that surveillance teams would be out and about. A bad time to make a drop if you're a spy. The FBI decided to duplicate the entire case database so that investigators could monitor Hansen's every keystroke in real time without detection. To do that took a series of supercomputers nearly a month to make a complete clone of this system. When he typed on the computer, anything he entered appeared at a, a separate computer away from him so we could see what he was entering. The FBI now had digital eyes on Hansen, and because investigators used paper to build the case against him, Hansen would not be able to have eyes on them. Hansen returned from the holidays to start his new job in January of 2001. His new boss was Rich Garcia. Hanson would come to resent Garcia. By virtue of this sweet new promotion, they were the same rank. Yet Garcia was his direct supervisor. 
I was using that to my advantage to try to make sure that he felt that I was incompetent, a bureaucratic buffoon. So that way he won't give too much of an idea that I might be actually investigating him. So you played the role of a buffoon. I had to be absent-minded to some extent. I gave him orders in the sense that all of his appointments and everything he does for this project has to go through me for approval, which I knew he wasn't going to like. And he was purposely trying to uh, divorce himself from my section and create his own section where he is the boss with his one employee, uh, the, the kid that we brought from the field. The kid is still the kid in the minds of some former FBI officials. Back then, Eric O'Neill was 27, attending law school at night and newly married. O'Neill was not an agent. For five years, he had served in the Bureau's special surveillance group. They were nicknamed the Ghosts, responsible for tailing high-value FBI targets without being noticed. You may remember him from our very first episode. So, to most of the FBI, I was known as Werewolf, which was my code name. O'Neill's boss showed up at his home early one Sunday morning and asked if he'd help them catch Hansen. He said, we don't want you to ghost him. We want you to work undercover in FBI headquarters in a new division we built just for him to try to determine whether he is a spy we've been after for some time. I'd spent a career in disguise, in the shadows, and now they wanted me to go undercover in FBI headquarters, which had never been done before. O'Neill would play himself this time as Hansen's underling. No disguise. He'd sit at the desk just outside Hansen's new office. O'Neill's boss laid out one more demand. I have to know now. And I said, right now, this moment? He said, yes, because my next meeting is with the director of the FBI, and I have to tell him whether you're in or out. In or out? These moments touch you in your life so rarely. And the big skill that really separates someone who's successful from someone who just gets by is seeing these moments and leaping at them. I had this sense that this was important, and so what could I say? I said, I'm in. Like Robert Hansen, Eric O'Neill knew computers. He even had experience writing code, which made his cover as Hansen's assistant all the more believable. They needed someone who knew how to hunt a spy, but also someone who knew how to turn on a computer. And the problem was that the FBI didn't have a lot of people who knew how to do both. The FBI decided to feed O'Neill the bare minimum about the Hansen case. Initially, he was told nothing about the letters, tape recording, or fingerprint implicating Hansen. I didn't know any of that. I only knew that he was suspected of espionage. And they kept that from you. Why? Because the more you know going in, the the harder it is to keep a straight face. You have to play a role. So giving you that information would have taken away some of your naivete. Exactly. They were worried that the more I knew, the more I could accidentally reveal to Hansen. And it turned out they were right. Because all Hansen did was talk, talk, talk. A guy who, for his entire career, was known for saying nothing and being quiet uh, and not revealing anything about himself was suddenly really interested in finding out everything he could about me. Because I was the only point of attack he had to find out whether this was a real job or the FBI had somehow learned he was the spy that they had been after. Hansen had a few habits that O'Neill picked up on. He wore the same suit every single day. Same suit. Never changed it in two and a half months. And I knew it was the same suit because it had the same distended, baggy left back pocket that he kept that big fat Palm Pilot in, which stretched and bulged that pocket out. O'Neill learned Hansen wanted to tell him things. He very much wanted to explain his genius to people. Now, he couldn't explain it by saying, so here's the thing, I'm the most damaging spy in U.S. history, and here's how I did it. That's what he wanted to do. But he had a very good way of getting around it by talking about how other spies did what they did and all their mistakes and how they could have done it better. And once I learned that he wanted to be the professor 
to a classroom of one, uh, I went with it. And it worked really well. It turned out O'Neill was a pretty good student. He would take mental notes throughout the day, memorizing what Hansen had said, then writing it all down once he got some alone time. He was a very difficult boss and a difficult manager. He would belittle me. He would call me everything from idiot to moron. There was a sliding scale of, you know, I'd start at idiot and uh, I'd, I'd reach moron at some point. It gets worse. He would, you know, stand behind and put his hands on my shoulders and lean over me and have, you know, be really close to my ear. And it was just horribly creepy. And I think that a lot of this was strategic. It was, it was done to uh, throw me back on my heels, to make me react to him constantly, to make me uncomfortable. For him to control the environment. For him to control the environment. And it worked. I always felt like I was one step behind him. I always felt like I was spending so much mental energy trying to make him happy, trying to get him to say good work, trying to wonder why he was standing next to me with his leg up on the table, you know, so that I was like a foot away from his junk. Things like that, right? O'Neill's job was to keep his eyes on Hansen and perpetuate the myth that Hansen's job was real and meaningful. It also meant attending phony meetings outside FBI headquarters. When Neil Gallagher had offered Hansen the job, he provided one more metaphorical hot towel as part of his full-service ego massage, one of the coveted parking passes at headquarters. He had not reserved space, but he could park somewhere in the third floor. That was another way to stroke him. It was. Now, the real reason the FBI gave Hansen a parking space was so evidence teams could search his car. FBI personnel would move Hansen's car and replace it with a filler vehicle that looked similar. A team would search the car for classified documents and then meticulously return the car to its parking spot on the third floor, even rolling back the odometer. It's put back to exactly the way it was when he parked it there. We're literally talking about a tenth of a mile. But one day, all didn't go as planned. Eric O'Neill arranged for a make-work meeting at the Defense Intelligence Agency and requisitioned a black FBI SUV for the ride over. The two went to the FBI garage, but the SUV was not there. Something was screwed up. He ended up deciding, I'm gonna take my car. We'll drive in my car. And I tried to talk him out of it. A team was planning to search Hansen's car while they were at the phony meeting. O'Neill stalled for time. He said they should walk around the multi-level FBI garage to find the black SUV. Floor after floor, they wandered. I'm dragging around. He got really angry at me. That resulted in him crossing the few feet between us, grabbing me by the lapels of my suit jacket and lifting me up on my toes and screaming in my face, spitting mad. Why do you insist we not take my car? Why are you so insistent? You've led us around on a wild goose chase through the parking area. There's got to be a reason. So I appealed to his ego and I said, no, 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 you don't understand. You should be driven in a big black SUV. You're important. Not show up in your personal vehicle, right? You need to be driven by a driver, me, in a bureau vehicle. So that when they see you, they know how important you are. O'Neill paused to see if this lie would work. You did that thing, that double look that spies and spy hunters do, where they look at you and then they hold it a little longer than comfortable. I call it the Jedi mind trick. They're just trying you to go, okay, fine, I'm sorry, I was lying, right? Just to spill, right? Just to push you over the edge. And he looked at me and looked at me and then he said, okay, Eric, but we'll take my car this time. I never made that mistake again. In late January, investigators found their first piece of evidence in Hansen's car. He has downloaded a document that he picked up out of an investigative file that he's made a copy of. It's a classified document, but it was uh, something of interest to the Russians. It was actually seven documents stuffed into a box in the trunk, a good indication that Hansen remained an active spy. Such recklessly handled classified material also freaked out FBI director Louis Free. The director, a former prosecutor, a former judge, 
is very acute to evidence, but at the same time, can't have a classified document disappear. So we convince him that we got such good coverage of him. I'll know every day that that document is still there because I'll get the results of the search, which I do day in and day out. And this went on every day? Every day. And every day after I got the results, I walked down to the director and told him with some sense of comfort that the document was still in the car. They found other clues in the car, a roll of tape, chalk, thumbtacks, all used to signal a drop had been made or picked up. Things between O'Neill and Hansen were often tense, made ever more so by Hansen's affinity for firearms. He did love his guns a lot. He was always armed. He had his bureau-issued 9 millimeter that he would wear in a hip holster, but he also had a firearm in an ankle holster that he would he would wear. The bureau was aware of what had happened to Kim Minoto, the support employee Hansen dragged across the floor. There was another violent incident in Hansen's past, too. A colleague had once seen him rough up a man on the street asking for money. We knew that he was prone to violence, but we didn't know how far he'd go, right? Uh, If he determined that I was undercover hunting him, he had nothing to lose. You know, in the eyes of the law, he already was a murderer. If things went south, there was a plan. O'Neill would go to Rich Garcia. So I was told that if you're in danger and you need to run, which could happen, his office is a few offices down and you get in there. Um, So uh, Rich spent all his time armed, (laughs) just in case that happened, because we had to plan for it. Hansen brought a canvas briefcase with him just about everywhere. It's a blue satchel with a very light leather trim that had four pockets, two on either side, zippered pockets, and each pocket was exactly the identical. He always had that bag on him. Sometimes he would leave the office with it, even just to walk down the hall. One day in early February, Hansen left it behind. I decided I was going to go in his office and search that bag myself you're not supposed to do. You bring in a search team. They're very meticulous. They know what they're doing. You know, I should have called it, but I just went in and looked in the bag. O'Neill found an SD card, like one you might find in a digital camera. He called in an evidence team to quickly process it. On the data card was a letter. And it was the first time we knew for certain that this was our guy. The letter connected Hansen to one of his code names, which was good, but not the beyond a reasonable doubt evidence the FBI needed. Eric tried one more idea, a gadget play. Hansen loved his Palm Pilot, talked about his Palm Pilot more than his wife. I mean, I was married to the thing. It was the pinnacle of technology back then, and he loved it. That gave O'Neill an idea. He would get a Palm Pilot of his own, an even newer one. And he'd get one for Hanson, really butter up the hard ass. O'Neill brought two shiny Palm Pilots back to room 9930. He goes, what's that? And I said, well, that's my Palm. He said, oh, really? Good for you. And then I grabbed his out of my desk and slid the brand new one over to him. And I said, I got one for you too, sir. This is a Palm 5. It's a lot faster than your model. He chuckled a little, pushed it back across the desk at me and said, you take that one back. I'll keep mine. He pulled his baby out of his back pocket, tapped it, and he said, I've written the encryption on this myself. These idiots at the FBI couldn't crack it on their best day. Well, they were going to have to try. He certainly wanted to protect this device, so we had to get it away from him. Much harder than it sounds because, if you remember, Hansen kept the Palm Pilot with him at all times in that baggy left back pocket. When it's in your back pocket, it's always in contact with your skin. You always know where it is. Of course, he couldn't sit on it. So when he sat down, he pulled it out, and he put it in his bag next to him. That way he would keep right next to his desk. He'd lean down, unzip a pocket, put it in, zip the pocket, sit back up, and then we'd carry on a conversation over and over and over again. A routine. And routines protect information. The imperative now? Break Hansen's routine. Separate him from his beloved device. 
this brings us back to the beginning of this series. Eric O'Neill would need to steal Hansen's Palm Pilot to see what was on it. And we had to get him away from his bag with sufficient time to get it out, copy the whole thing, and get it back before he knew it was gone. The ruse was pretty simple. Play a macho mind trick on Hansen, get him flustered and angry at the same time. It involved Rich Garcia, the agent you met earlier who built the bugged-out office, and Gene O'Leary, an assistant director at the Bureau. They would burst into Hansen's office and challenge him to a shooting contest at the FBI gun range in the basement of headquarters, 10 floors down. It was a Thursday morning, around 11. Rich Garcia. O'Leary and I went into the office real quick and, and told Hansen, drop what you're doing, we're going to go down and do a shoot. And he said, well, he's busy. He says, and O'Leary being his boss, he said, no, nothing's too important right now. You know, and he threw a $20 bill on the table. It says, you know, let's be a little bit money on this thing. He said, Richard's, he's on board. And the idea was to be jarring and possibly get Hansen off his game. Exactly. We had to disrupt his ability to plan it out the way he wants to do it and make him do what we want him to do without any excuses. Hansen reluctantly agreed. He grumbled to his feet, opened his desk, and grabbed his gun. And for the first time, he's forgotten to reach down to that bag. We broke his routine and pulled out his palm pilot, and I'm really excited. An FBI employee at the shooting range sent O'Neill a page when Hansen arrived. He went to his bag, kneeled down, opened all the pockets, rifled through the bag, found the palm pilot. You know, hands are shaking. This finally worked. We finally got it. I found a floppy disk and a data card, grabbed all three things, ran down three flights of steps uh, to the sixth floor where we had this tech room and we had a tech team that had just been waiting. The door had no number, no nameplate. O'Neill had to memorize its location on the sixth floor. I handed over the devices and said, go. They started copying them. I'm waiting outside in the hall. The FBI gun range is a subterranean soundproofed enclosure. You hear muffled gunfire when you're close to the door. Hansen and his bosses grabbed ear and eye protection and started shooting. The bosses insisted Hansen join them in a series of shooting games. Closest to the bullseye, or let's do rapid fire, or let's try this with two shots only, or let's do this with five shots, but reload. Just kind of keep things moving at a slower pace. In other words, give O'Neill and the tech team time. Can you recall how much time it was from exit the door of the office to the time that you see Hanson leave and go back up, roughly? Roughly uh, a little bit over an hour. Hanson lost the challenge and 20 bucks. Once Hanson shook his hand and said goodbye and, and left my sight, I was on the phone. He's on the way up. So they knew at that point from him get into the elevators, get into his office, probably took you between five to seven minutes, maybe 10 at the best. Hansen was on the move. O'Neill knocked on the tech team's door. The tech guys, they're like, yeah, we're almost done. Don't worry. And I said, you don't understand. He's armed and I'm not. And if I don't get up there before him, it's game over. Finally, the door opened. O'Neill grabbed the goods from a colleague. He sprinted back up three flights of steps, raced into his office, got to Hansen's desk, and knelt down in front of his bag. And my heart just fell because I looked at his bag and realized I'm holding a Palm Pilot, a SanDisk data card, and a floppy disk. And there are four pockets that are open, and I have no idea which pocket these things were in. The only thing I could remember was that the Palm Pilot was next to the floppy disk. That's it. One way or another, O'Neill had to make a choice. And quickly, Hansen was coming. So I just dropped all the devices, best guess, you know, like on a standardized test, you circle C when you're guessing, circled C, zipped everything back up, ran to my desk, sat there, started to pretend I was typing something and put like the best poker face I've ever had right on my face. Hansen walked through room 9930's secure door, pissed. Livid even, embarrassed on the shooting range by his bosses. He slammed his office door so hard, the wall shook. And I'm right next to that wall, right where my desk is, and just a few feet away through a wall is his desk, and I can hear the zip. 
And I'm thinking to myself, I'm dead. I've blown this case. I ruined everything. I'm a stupid rookie. It's my fault. And even if I survive, I'm never living this down. I truly thought that he was going to come out there with his firearm in his hand. Because there's no way I could have got it right. But on the other hand, I thought, if I got it right, if by the grace of God, I got it right, and I'm not here when he comes out, he's going to be so hysterically paranoid. O'Neill waited. He comes out of his office, walks right to my desk, leans over it with two hands on the front of it, looks me right in the eye, and he says, were you in my office? And I just thought, this is it. It's all over for me. He knows. He's got to know. I can see it on his face. He knows. And cool as a cucumber, I looked him right in the eye and I said, yeah, I was in there. I put a memo in your inbox. I signed, dated today. Didn't you see it? And he holds my glare. He just holds my eyes for so long that I can feel my stomach tightening, that like I'm sweating all the way down my back, but somehow I kept it off my forehead. Just force of will against physiology, right? And he does a thing where he looks at me and looks at me for so long that you almost want to burst out laughing because the tension is so, so thick. And finally I look back and I just said, what? And he takes a step back and he points to, points at me, his fingers like right in my face. We moved like a fraction closer. He'd poke my eye out. He says, I never want you in my office again. Did you get the pockets right? The only answer to that mathematical equation is yes. Because had I got those pockets wrong, there was no way he would have made that funnel drop. The FBI got what it was looking for. Despite Hansen's belief that no one could possibly get through his top-notch encryption, They'd cracked his code. On the Palm Pilot, the FBI found the time and place of Hansen's next dead drop and letters from Hansen to the Russians. This was a Thursday. According to the Palm Pilot, Hansen's next drop would be Sunday, three days away. Best friend Jack Hoshauer had been staying at the Hansons' home in Virginia. The visit was coming to an end. It was Sunday, February 18th, 2001, a cool, clear afternoon. Jack and Hanson were getting ready to leave for the airport. I opened the trunk on his car, and he said, don't put your bag in there, put it in the back seat. The trunk was already full of classified documents. They rode out to Dulles Airport. Is there anything memorable about that drive from Vienna to Dulles the last time you spoke to Bob? Perfectly normal. Do you remember the last thing he said to you? Or you said to him? Probably something was, I'll send an email when I get to Phoenix. (laughs) I mean, it was just a perfectly mundane thing. Before they parted, Hanson gave his best friend a book, The Man Who Was Thursday by G.K. Chesterton. After dropping off Jack, Hanson headed back toward home for family dinner. But first, he decided to deliver a gift to his Russian friends. And a final letter. Our colleague reading for Hanson again. Dear friends, I thank you for your assistance these many years. It seems, however, that my greatest utility to you has come to an end. And it is time to seclude myself from active service. Since communicating last, and one wonders if because of it, I have been promoted to a higher do-nothing senior executive job outside of regular access to information within the counterintelligence program. It is as if I'm being isolated. Furthermore, I believe I have detected repeated bursting radio signal emanations from my vehicle. I have not found their source, but as you wisely do, I will leave this alone for knowledge of their existence is sufficient, amusing the games children play. In this, however, I strongly suspect you should have concerns for the integrity of your compartment concerning knowledge of my efforts on your behalf. Something has aroused the sleeping tiger. Perhaps you know better than I. Life is full of its ups and downs. 
My hope is that if you respond to this constant conditions of connection message, you will have provided some sufficient means of recontact besides it. If not, I will be in contact next year, same time, same place. Perhaps the correlation of forces and circumstances then will have improved. Your friend, Ramon Garcia. Hansen wrote as though this would be his last contact for a while. The FBI was ready. You know, there's that saying, if you're not early, you're late. Uh, thank goodness we were early. Special Agent Steve Pluta, a 25-year FBI man and the case agent assigned to the Hansen investigation, got to Foxstone Park in an unmarked vehicle that afternoon. They didn't know exactly what time the drop would happen, but information on Hansen's Palm Pilot suggested 8 p.m. And actually, we had a little debate at that time as to what time we would go out there. Um, some thought that we could wait until nightfall. Former FBI Special Agent Deborah Smith supervised CI-13, the FBI squad running the investigation. We introduced you to her earlier in the series. She helped reel in the Russian who gave over Hansen's letters, the trash bag with his fingerprints, and the recording of his voice. She was the boss at Foxstone that day. Foxstone Park is tucked into a pleasant, suburban neighborhood of Vienna, Virginia, mere blocks from the Hansen home. A footbridge connected to the main entrance by a jogging path was one drop site Hansen routinely used to swap American documents for money. The drop site was codenamed Ellis. Houses are right here, all yeah. along. My producer, Arden Fari, and I went there on February 18th of 2022 to get a sense of the place at roughly the same time and day Hansen was there, 21 years earlier. It's not okay. what you would think of as secluded. Right, but it's not out in the open. It's not out in the open, but it's not secluded like super secret. The footbridge had been renovated, but not much else had changed. What knocks me out is those houses in all likelihood were here. Mm -hmm. And one, two, three of them, basically, if you're just looking out your window. Yeah. And you say, I wonder what the guy in the suit jacket is doing. He's, he's walking down underneath the bridge. He has something in his hand. You, anyone could have seen that. But you have to know what you're looking for. Exactly. But it, ju it just doesn't seem... A cloak and dagger as we're led to believe, you know? It's yeah. it's it's almost banal. Yeah. But maybe that's maybe that's kind of the point that I don't know. You you can blend in, hide in plain sight, whatever, you know. Yeah. I mean I stand out right here in a suit and in, in a, in yeah, a you're basically dressed like Hanson. Yeah, I try to do it. On Hanson's way back from the airport, he made a pit stop at the Pike Seven Plaza shopping center in northern Virginia, not far from the park. It was four twenty one PM parked um, and went to the trunk of his car and was actually preparing the package there, standing at the trunk of his car, so wrapping it in the dark trash bag and covering it with tape. It was broad daylight. He's at the back of his car, trunk open, wrapping up secret documents. It was broad daylight. That yes. strikes me as brazen, almost. Well, think about this. He's been doing this for a long time. He'd been doing this for quite some time, and he hadn't gotten caught. So perhaps you felt a little safe or comfortable doing it that way. Hansen then drove his silver 1997 Ford Taurus to the park entrance and left it on Fairway Drive, a short walk away. Wearing a dark suit over a black turtleneck, Hansen got out of his car, package in hand. Smith and Pluta monitored FBI radio traffic from vehicles near Foxstone's entrance. Surveillance teams positioned in the park relayed Hansen's every move. Key details were conveyed to the directors of the FBI and CIA. Everyone was prepared and people, you know, started saying, okay, this is where he's parking, he's walking into the park, he's doing the drop. At 4.34 p.m., Hansen placed a piece of white tape on the park sign, a signal to the Russians that their delivery would be ready for pickup. He then walked down the path toward the footbridge drop site. Under the bridge, 
he placed a black garbage bag filled with a computer diskette containing the encrypted letter and seven FBI documents classified secret. Nine minutes after making the drop, Hansen emerged from the park and walked nonchalantly up the hill back toward his car. I gave the order to take him down. So I just said, go ahead and take him. Take him now. A half a dozen FBI personnel, some with guns drawn, rushed Hansen. He was an agent. We knew that he had a gun. Uh, and he had privileges. He could carry that gun wherever he wanted within this country. But there was no gun, no fight, no resistance. Two agents yanked Hansen's arms behind his back and cuffed him. They searched him for weapons and, finding none, placed him in the back of an FBI vehicle. It was uh, totally without incident. And we got everything we needed at that point. We had the package that he dropped. On the signal site, he put a signal there for the Russians. There's some dispute about what Hansen said at that moment. Numerous accounts suggest he looked at the FBI agents arrayed around him and said, what took you so long? 22 years of unfettered espionage is quite a while. But others told us Hansen actually said, so this is how it goes. The FBI released video of the arrest. You can watch it on YouTube, but you will notice it's silent. We asked the Bureau for the tape with audio, but we're told they looked and couldn't find it. Case agent Steve Pluta was there. I walk over and escort him to the vehicle, read him his rights, and my co-case agent is actually showing him photos of all the drop sites, of all the signal sites, And he starts nodding his head, and he agrees to talk. And the question is, who have you been spying for? The Russians. Anyone else? No, just the Russians. That was a confession. And he makes a comment where it's the effect of something that I wanted to get caught. And so play along with that. And how long have you wanted to get caught? And he says, since the beginning. And then we try to pursue couple more questions, and next thing you know, he lawyers up. Pluta climbed into one side of an SUV. His colleague took the other. In the middle, Hansen, handcuffed and sandwiched between the two agents. Their destination? The FBI office in Tyson's Corner, Virginia. Hansen was granted a phone call to Bonnie. And the first words out of her mouth is, why did you do it? What does that statement tell you? It's not, did you do it, or are you accused of doing it, but why did you do it? That's next time on Agent of Betrayal, The Double Life of Robert Hansen. This series was reported by me, Major Garrett, Arden Fari, and Sarah Cook. Our team of reporters and producers also includes Jamie Benson, Pat Milton, Jake Rosen, and Nellie Watson. Our producing partner is Neon Hum Media, our senior producer is Odelia Rubin. Zoe Culkin is our associate producer. Original music and sound design by Hans Dale Shi. Additional music from Blue Dot Sessions. Executive producers for Agent of Betrayal are Arden Fari, Shara Morris, and me, Major Garrett. Special thanks to Mark Lima, Megan Marcus, Ingrid Cyprian Matthews, and Steve Racies of CBS News, and Jonathan Hirsch of Neon Hum Media. We welcome you to contact us at agentofbetrayal at cbsnews.com. That's agentofbetrayal at cbsnews.com. Thanks for listening.